Welcome everyone, Stealthy Sharon here, and today I'm bringing you my review of the Humble Choice Bundle for October 2024. A couple duds this month, but overall, this was a really good month. Let me know what you think of this month's bundle in the comments below. Be sure to check the timestamps for specific games, and stay tuned for my final thoughts in the end. Okay, let's get to the review. First up is McPixel 3 which is a kind of puzzle game where you have to figure out how to get your guy out of crazy situations. It actually reminded me a lot of the Henry Stickman collection that we got in Humble years ago. Despite not really caring for that too much, I still liked it better than this game. McPixel 3 is supposed to be a humorous game, but humor being really subjective, I didn't find this funny at all. I can't remember even cracking a smile at any of the gags. I found it really weird that his primary action for interacting is usually kicking something or urinating. Like, why? I guess this is supposed to be funny, but I don't really get it. I also dislike the jarring nature of the game since it jumps from level to level constantly. This barely gives you time to process anything before you're already whisked away to the next scenario. Although I suppose this is the point and a conscious design decision. It's just not something I enjoyed. Luckily, the game is easy to pick up and play, and the challenge becomes trying to interact with the right things in the appropriate order to clear each level. I will say that each of the levels did have creativity to them, and there must have been a ton of work put into the pixel art to have unique art for it all. It's a style I don't particularly care for, but it was commendable nonetheless. Oh, and while the one music track that played for the majority of the game wasn't bad, it did get grating after a while. I can't see myself coming back to this, and given that this feels like something better suited for mobile, which it seems like it can work on touchscreens, I don't really know who I'd recommend it to. Next is the sole horror title we received in the October bundle, being Remnant Records. It's like Phasmophobia where you're hunting ghosts, but with a few changes that may or may not be to your liking for fans of that game. First, it uses randomly generated narratives to tell the story of the ghost. This is in the form of nodes scattered throughout the map to determine things about the deceased. This is especially important because in order to exorcise the ghost, you need to find objects that are unique specific to them to successfully bind the spirit. On paper, this seems like a neat change from other games like this, but I'm not sure I really liked it. Despite having the nodes, there was still a lot of guesswork involved. I tried random objects that I thought were loosely related after a while because I kept failing the exorcism. Furthermore, the notes seem to be slightly nonsensical and in places that just don't make sense. Why is a confession of accidentally killing someone on a hunting trip front and center in the kids' room? The one map I played on didn't really suggest to me someone actually lived there. The empty areas were weird and the repetitive use of assets was jarring. These felt like store-bought assets, which I don't see as anything wrong, but only if they're used right, and that's not the case here. Some other differences from Phasmophobia is the various roles the players can take on, and the ghosts apparently operate differently in a group. I only ever played one role and did it by myself, so I can't really comment too much on that. You can also level up each role to have them perform better, such as a stronger flashlight for the electrician. Despite some fresh takes on the genre, the game's execution is lacking across the board, and I won't be coming back to this one either. Station to Station is a very zen, train tycoon simulator. Or at least, at a glance, it looks like a train tycoon simulator, but I'd say it's closer to a puzzle game. Station to Station brings the act of building railroads, but without the complexity many dedicated railroad sims might have. Each map has a number of buildings that you need to connect via train lines to provide goods, which nets you more money and new buildings to connect. You can modify each line as you're placing it, but not after it's been finalized. The only way to reset a train line is to reset to the last checkpoint or restart the map. So, as the production chains become more complicated, you'll need to think carefully on how to place each railroad. Along with supplying the buildings on each level, you also have separate fund challenges that require you to end the level with a certain amount of money, and star challenges. They usually involve some sort of requirement when building tracks, like building under a certain distance of track, or don't build any bridges. I did have one to find four camels, though. 
All of these things do require a bit more thought to complete, but the main objective really is just to enjoy the experience of connecting tracks and watching the world come to life. Each building you finish will bring color to the world around it until the whole map is vibrant and full of life. The graphics, while low poly, are charming, and I like zooming in close to see the new buildings and enjoy the world I helped put together. This was a very relaxing title and one that I definitely want to come back to in the future. I could see it as a quick distraction to play a level or two before moving on to something else. Next is Jack Move, a self-described Japanese-style RPG, and I definitely can see what they mean. All the combat is turn-based, and you have different moves that your character can do. They all build up an ultimate that, of course, does a lot of damage. One unique thing about the combat system is the ability to swap out skills mid-battle. Although, since it was so early on, I didn't actually do that. For the most part, the rest of the combat felt very familiar and didn't break the mold all that much, other than having quasi-computer speak for the moves, abilities, and items, since you're supposed to be a hacker. Personally, I think it's going to be the setting that keeps the player's attention. The world is interesting as it's a post-apocalyptic cyberpunk world that suffered from a near-modern society collapse. Now the world is controlled by corporations in typical fashion of the cyberpunk genre. You play as Noah, who suddenly gets word that her estranged father is in trouble with Monomind, the evil corpos, and she feels inclined to rescue him and find out why he's her target. I'm not too sure if I'd come back to this anytime soon, though. The short playtime of about 7 hours does make it more enticing, but it didn't really do enough to impress me. Don't Keeper is a roguelite about digging for resources to keep your base upgraded in order to stave off increasingly dangerous waves of enemies. The gameplay loop revolves around digging into the ground and finding resources to mine. These resources can be used to upgrade the player character to make them more efficient, or the dome to provide better defensive or offensive capabilities. Additionally, you could find dome add-ons that provide things like a really useful mine elevator or the stun laser. In the mode I was playing, you also were digging for a relic, which was the thing necessary to win the run. The caveat is, during all this digging around in the dirt, you'll be attacked by monsters. This requires you to drop what you're doing and rush to the surface to man the guns. And it's all incredibly addicting trying to get that next upgrade or fend off another wave. I played for about an hour and a half and had a blast doing so. The mining reminded me a lot of Terraria and finding a large ore vein was just as great a feeling here. While the combat was simple, the fights were tense at times and also relieving when I completed a wave that I thought might finish me. I want to come back to this one soon, and maybe sooner rather than later. To long-term viewers of the channel, this might be surprising to hear since this is a roguelite and I'm not the biggest fan, but Dome Keeper has a fresh take on the genre and I really enjoyed it. Jusant is another game with a relaxing vibe, but it's about climbing in a post-apocalyptic world rather than railroad building. In Jusant, the water has turned to desert as the waters receded. You're scaling an impossibly large mountain, or tower, that used to house people. Throughout your journey, you learn more about the mysterious structure and its once inhabitants. Besides the notes and letters you find, there are no real words spoken. The protagonist and his cute companion are largely silent and only make the occasional grunts or chirps. This creates a very ambient game. The game world is well designed and a lot of thought was put into the environmental storytelling. The controls are unique as well with how you climb. It took me a bit to get used to the constant alternating of buttons, or in my case, the controller triggers, but I started getting the hang of it rather quickly. The game does a really good job teaching you on the fly how to play the game, which I thought was clever. In fact, I didn't even notice when the tutorial prompt stopped showing up because it taught me well enough to know what to do in a given situation. There's a lot of exploration to be had here, and the puzzle in figuring out how to explore the tower. It's not simply climbing up in a straight manner. Instead, you'll need to move along the side, backtrack, use your pistons in unique ways, etc. to get to the places you want. Eventually, your companion can help with traversal, which adds new elements to how you tackle each climbing encounter. This is another game where I really like the zen nature of it. It was relaxing to only have to worry about the climbing, and really nothing else. There is a stamina bar, and you do want to place your pistons accordingly, 
but nothing feels overly difficult. Basically, another real banger this month that I want to play some more of post-review. The penultimate game of the bundle is Persona 5 Strikers. I've wanted to jump into the Persona series for a while now, and never really took the opportunity. So, I'm kinda happy to have gotten this, although I wish it had been the mainline Persona 5 game instead of the spin-off sequel. And this is largely because the game seems to expect you to know who these characters are, their relationship with one another, and shared history. And I don't. I was fairly confused for the most part, other than knowing that these characters were good friends. The combat is pretty good, and I guess it would be similar to something like a Musou game, although I'm not familiar enough with that genre to be able to say that confidently. Anyway, what we have here is a real-time action combat system where you take out hordes and hordes of enemies. It's hectic, but pretty fun. And I guess completely different from the mainline Persona games, which is yet another reason why I wish we had gotten one of those instead. That said, I can't really complain that much. I thought the game was fun, and I loved the animation style for both the game itself and the high-quality anime cutscenes. Can't wait to come back to this, but I really don't think it will be until I get around to playing Persona 5. And the final game of the bundle is Remnant 2, one I actually already owned and just recently completed the main campaign with a buddy. For some long-term subscribers of Humble, we received the original some time ago, which I also really enjoyed, and I actually made a review on it on the old channel. Although, I reposted it here for those interested in hearing my thoughts on Remnant from the Ashes. For those who don't know what Remnant is, it basically answers the question of what would you get if you mix Souls-like with guns. And it does the job wonderfully. The action is intense at times, and the bosses this time around are a lot of fun, with much less of a reliance on extra mobs like was the case in the first game. I enjoyed all three of the worlds you travel to, and felt there were a lot of variation in the enemies and the environmental design. The storytelling was stronger in this one, but it's definitely not going to be the thing that keeps you playing. Although, I did find a lot of it interesting, but that's because I have so many hours invested in this game and its predecessor. This time around, the game gives you even more options than the first one with the ability to customize your traits, guns, slot multiple rings, and customize some other passives with the prism. On top of that, they introduce archetypes, basically a class, where you could swap two of them in and out to find a playstyle that works for you, or customize it to tackle a specific challenge. As mentioned, I beat the game and I'm now working through the DLC, but if it's anything like the first one, the fun in this game really starts when you go through the campaign another time, probably on a higher difficulty. This is because you now have access to a wider arsenal to experiment with from the get-go, but also because the game has random dungeons that can appear. These can also be done in adventure modes, which are shorter stints, but playing the campaign over at a higher difficulty is also fun for bragging rights, as well as being able to fight bosses specific to the story. Despite already owning Remnant 2 and all of its DLC, I was really happy to get this in Humble because now I could gift it to my wife and do a multiplayer campaign with her. I'm obviously going to keep playing this one and would recommend everyone to give it a shot if it looks remotely interesting to you. Okay, let's wrap this up and see if this bundle was worth it or not. I based my rating solely on whether I thought the game was worth playing on about an hour or so of hands-on gameplay. Also, I'd be grateful if you could please give the video a like if you're enjoying it, because that really helps me out with the YouTube algorithm gods. Overall, this was a really decent month. Despite some misses, I think they are weighed out by the wins this month. I guess my only wish is that there was another horror title given, or at least a better one. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I do enjoy this genre, and I like it when we get something for the October month. I guess the Callisto Protocol given a few months back is what was supposed to make up for it, which is another shameless plug for a review, which you could find in the card above. And to end this section off, I have a few other things to mention. First, a big welcome to all the new subscribers I've gained lately on this channel. And that brings me to the other thing, which isn't great, but yeah. King Link is no longer making Humble Choice reviews after this month. I'm sure many of you watched his reviews over the years, and I really enjoyed watching them myself and comparing each other's thoughts. He'll be missed in the community, but... Hopefully it won't be the last we hear from him with future content. 
Many of my recent subscribers came from his channel, and I'm immensely grateful for King Link recommending me, and also to all of you for giving me a chance. Hopefully, I could live up to expectations and provide you with helpful reviews going forward. But enough about all that, let's get to the recommendations. In the must-play category this month, I've placed Remnant 2 and Domekeeper. Of course, you already knew I was going to put Remnant 2 here. I've had so much fun with this franchise over the years. It's obviously great with friends, but I'd even recommend it as a good gateway game into Souls-like if you're someone who doesn't care for them and is only playing solo. Domekeeper was a fun surprise. It has a great gameplay loop that really trims the fat down to the things that matter. I'm looking forward to unlocking more stuff in the game with subsequent runs. And the strong recommendations this month are Jusant, Persona 5 Strikers, and Station to Station. Jusant's climbing mechanic is perfect for when you want a chill gaming session. Persona 5 Strikers may not have been the Persona game I was hoping to get, but I can't deny that it seemed like a fun game. Finally, Station to Station is another chill experience that will be fun to come back to and lay down more railroad tracks. The weak recommendation spot is held by one title being Jack Move. As mentioned, it seemed interesting, but not enough to get me to play it right away. I definitely felt like it was a solid game though. And in the Don't Bother With section is McPixel 3 and Remnant Records. I'm sure there are people out there who would enjoy McPixel 3 for its humor and gameplay, but I wasn't one of them. Remnant Records brings some different ideas, but felt ultimately unpolished and undercooked. Do you agree with my thoughts? What games, if any, are you looking forward to playing? Let me know what your thoughts are, if there are any different recommendations you'd make in the comments below. I hope this video helped you in some small way, and if it did, then please consider leaving a like, comment, subscribe, or whatever it is you feel like doing. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day.